Welcome everyone to Senate Education, uh, Wednesday afternoon, January 10th, 1.30. Ms. Richter, do you mind joining us at the table? Happy Julia Richter is, uh, is your title fiscal analyst? It's senior fiscal analyst. Senior, that's, what, uh, yeah, no, I, I knew it was gonna be something more than, I missed, yeah, I get it. We wanna be accurate with the Joint Fiscal Office. And we're really happy that you're here to talk to us. Uh, some of it will be, will be a review, some new information. What the committee is interested in, if I could just sort of tee it up for a, a minute, not only with your testimony, but later we're gonna hear from Beth St. James, and I think a little bit from you again uh, at the end of the day, on trying to understand what's happening out there in the education front, particularly around the education front uh, fund, uh, taxes, people have heard a lot over the past several months about increase in taxes. So we thought we, well, I should also mention we've heard quite a bit about the possible uh, impact of the weighting, uh, which was Act 127, which this body passed two years ago. And so uh, we thought we'd kick it off with you with going back, talking a little bit about the education fund, helping us understand it, what's in it, all that sort of thing. So with that, unless I'm missing something, committee, okay. And we have with us a Finn is from Orca, uh, and he is going, so folks know, be videotaping us as well. Thanks. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. For the record, Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. Nice to see you all. I think this is my first time in your committee this year. Mm -hmm. So great to be back. Um, there are a few documents that I have prepared for today's testimony. I was a little late getting them to Morgan. Uh, so I don't know, would you would you like me to share my screen? Do folks want to pull it up in front of them? How would you like I to do it? I think both would be great if you would oh, share your okay. screen so, yeah. and if anybody wants to pull it up. <laughs> <Yeah. everybody. laughs> would I have a, could I have a Zoom link please? I'll send it to you right now. Okay. It looks like we have a folder for today so we don't have it. Uh, on the website? Yeah. You did say you just got them to Morgan a little while ago? I did, yes. Okay. Morgan, do you have those documents? Uh, they, are, they should be up on the committee page. Okay. Let's see. So, in the, in the Tuesday folders? In the Tuesday folders? or uh, Today's Wednesday, so Wednesday folders, right? Yes. Great. Are you seeing those? We don't see them. No. But I think we should get started. Sure. I'm happy to pull it up on my screen. We'd like it to pull um, it up on your screen for sure. And I'm just joining the Zoom link now. Thank you. And while we're working through all of these technical... Yeah. Um, as we're working through the technical things that we're dealing with at the moment, um, just a little bit of background in terms of level setting. There, the, There is a presentation for the Education Fund 101 to sort of review and level set, you know, education fund, how it works, how pupil weights fit into the ed fund, what, what comes into the ed fund, what goes out of the ed fund. Um, there's probably a bit more information in the slides than we may get to today than may be relevant for the committee. So there's a lot in there and it really is hopefully a resource to help move forward. So we'll do a little bit of level setting with education finance. 101 and then moving forward to the December 1st letter and the corresponding for estimated forecasted um, property tax bill increases. What those mean, what they don't mean, what has gone into those estimates. Um, all right. You should be able to. Hi. Perfect. Thank you. And we did ask Morgan to put the, and Morgan just send us a let Megan know when they these documents are in our folders. Yeah, we're not. Absolutely. Thanks. Great. So, is that a good size for folks? Yep. All right. So this is a presentation I've given, um, I think, to this committee before, as well as to other committees um, and your colleagues' house side. And so essentially what we're going to do, big picture overview, Ed Fund and Ed Finance. How does it work? We're gonna dive a little bit into education expenditures out of the education fund, and then dive a little bit deeper and talk about education funding, the property taxes, the non-property tax revenue sources, and pupil weights. Um, and before going diving in any deeper, I do wanna just say that we're talking about state 
education funding, so I'm not bringing in federal funds into this conversation. We're just talking about state dollars. So big picture overview. Um, Vermont's education funding system is different than other states. It's unique. Um, that's because it's a statewide funding formula that's coupled with local property tax administration. Essentially what that means is that school district spending is determined at the local level. Um, school boards set budgets that must be approved by voters. And in the legislature, the General Assembly sets education yields, we'll talk about what that means, and tax rates, property tax rates, annually at the level necessary to fund education expenditures. And this is different from other funds that we talk about in the state because, you know, the general fund, we say, okay, we've got this much money, this is how it's getting parsed out, right? The education fund, it's, okay, what are all of the things that we need to pay out of the education fund, and then how are we going to make sure that there's sufficient revenue to pay out all of those expenditures? Two types of property taxes, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. There's the homestead property tax and the non-homestead property tax. And then finally, since the Brigham decision, which was a, um, a Supreme Court case, um, now the homestead property tax rate is a district of, uh, is a function of district per pupil spending decisions. So this is different where it's not a function of property wealth. So regardless of a district's property wealth, its homestead rates are going to depend on its per pupil spending and not on how much can be raised on its grand list. Yes, Senator Hewitt. Is it okay if we ask questions as we oh, get? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. Okay. Could you unpack for us a little bit how the legislature sets the education yields and the property tax rates? Because um, I think for a lot of folks that's kind of shrouded in mystery. Definitely. Um, I'll say it's an annual process starts in the traditionally in ways and means and then moves through the building accordingly to make sure that there are sufficient revenues raised and thinking about the calculation of that and where those numbers come from i think may be helpful to dive into a little bit later when talking about the setting of tax rates if that's okay sure um to sort of level set how do we know how much money needs to be raised and what does that look like so while we're also on the Brigham decision, so would you help the committee understand how, when you say Vermont's property tax or education funding is different, if you go over the border, New York, Massachusetts, what's happening there that, or in other states, that's not happening or happening in a different way? Yeah, so it really varies by state. Mm -hmm. um, usually, um, education is funded by some combination of both state revenue or state um, funds as well as funds that have been raised at the local level to help fund school districts. So Vermont is all state education funded, whereas other states have this town component and a state component. Um, Vermont also has local decisions in terms of its school budgets. So in other states, often when referring to pupil waiting, for instance, it's okay, this pupil weight corresponds with X number of dollars extra that that school district receives for having students in certain categories um, that may or be, may not be less costly to educate. Vermont does not use pupil weights in the same way. Um, here they're used more to adjust tax rates and tax capacity. So the state is not saying, here's X number of dollars because you have X number of students in grade five Instead, they're saying, okay, we're going to adjust your ability to draw funds from the education fund for a certain tax rate. There are also funds that come out of the education fund that are determined at the state level um, that are written into statute. So certain special education dollars, transportation aid, universal school meals, those are some examples. So does it matter, and this might be helpful for everyone to hear, does it matter where you live in the state, uh, does it make a difference how much your school might end up getting? Does that play a role in any way? So, in, in, historically, in other states, 
where you live, generally your go your school is going to historically, I think, get more. Does that make a difference in Vermont? It does not make a difference in the sense of if you live in this community, mm -hmm. this school district is going to receive X number of dollars because it's this community. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference in terms of the makeup of the student population sure. in a district yep. and how the property tax rates are calculated. Okay. Through pupil weighting. Right. Thank you. Sure. So yes, please interrupt me with questions as I go along. This is a lot to unpack and is I'll stay high level. Okay, I'm gonna ask you the stupid question of the day. So homestead versus non-homestead, which one's in state, out of state, second home? I just have not really dealt with the concept. Sure. So um, yeah, maybe I'll just move forward and we can talk about well talk about this in a second. Um Homestead, non-homestead. So homestead is essentially someone's principal primary dwelling and all of the corresponding land acreage that goes with that dwelling. Um, homestead taxes are where the income sensitivity portion falls in the property tax credit. Um, non-homestead is everything else that's subject to property tax that's not a homestead. So that includes apartments, and apartment buildings, it includes businesses and commercial properties, it includes second homes. So that's a uniform tax rate across the state for anything that's not a homestead. Uniform um, before the CLA has been applied. And Ken, you just said that 10,000 feet gave a sense of the, the relationship between the two, like one is 75% of the other or? Yes. So this is, um, I haven't had a chance to update this chart. I've been a little busy with lots of folks trying to understand the Ed Fund. Um, but this is the Ed Fund sources in 2022, just to have a sense of what we're looking at. So the green boxes, those are your property taxes. So the dark green far left, you'll see that non-homestead is about 40%. And then the lighter green is the net homestead education property tax. It's net because it's including the property tax credit, the income sensitivity portion. Okay, this is good, but my question really is, um, a second home versus a primary home, how are they taxed? So a uh, primary home would be um, subject to the homestead property tax rate for the school district that it's in, right. and a second home would be subject to the non-homestead property tax. Okay. So is there like a, Again, at a high level, how do they compare like uh, second home, ho uh, non-homestead tax rate is 50% oh. of homestead. Oh, uh, I see what you're asking. So you're asking about the relationship in the tax rates. Correct. So that's a policy decision right. and that varies by year. Um, right. We will talk about, and I can, um, it's, it's posted you, on your mind. example. You know, so, okay, so this year, last year, or 10 years, or anything, just, just get a sense of it. Okay, so I will preface this with hold on, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Um, give me a second. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is the December 1st Ed Fund Outlook. I think that before we dive into it in great detail, it'd be helpful to have a little bit more context. But the homestead property tax rate does vary by school district based on spending decisions. So the average is just that, it's an average. Um, that being said, and this is equalized level, so the uniform non-homestead property tax rate in FY24, 1.391, and for homestead, 1.311. Okay, that helps. It's very close. Sure. About one third, two thirds. It's really, a, it's, it's really a policy, I'm, I'm not trying to be opaque, it's really a policy right. decision and it depends on the year. So it's up to the General Assembly every year how the tax rates are calculated. Um, and, and it's the policy decision really is when I'm doing the modeling and looking at, okay, what are we going to, for setting the property tax rates, how are we going to do that? The question is, um, usually comes back to what is the average bill change going to be in the different classes? So what would be the average bill change for a non-homestead property tax payer? And what would be the average bill change for a homestead property tax payer? Um, 
and that is a policy decision. So for instance, last year I was asked to solve for the yield and the non-homestead rate so that the average bill change would be uniform for both property classes. So because we're thinking about a tax bill as having two components, the rate, the property value, a direct comparison of rates is not always going to tell the whole picture, right? Because certain properties may be growing more or less, um, depending on the community that they're in. So we, we talk about the average bill change. Um, does that does that get yeah, at what you're asking? Okay. So so going into education expenditures that are paid out of the education fund. And this is, I think, a helpful place to really ground the conversation in terms of starting because you'll recall that the ed fund is different where the total amount that needs to be raised by property taxes directly corresponds to how much needs to be paid out of the ed fund. So starting at the local level, we'll talk about the local level and then the state level because local school districts are building budgets that are then put forth to the local voters. Um, each year, a school district builds an annual budget. It requires local voter approval. And um, in general, and this is a high level presentation, in general, we can kind of think about these school budgets having, as having two parts, sort of two buckets. One is the offsetting revenues. And this includes things like state categorical aid. So how much is the state saying you get based on what is written in the green books you get x number of dollars for special education or universal school meals it also includes tuition revenues that are paid to that school district so other schools are sending kids and the school district needs to educate those students prior year surpluses or deficits reserve funds so those are the offsetting revenues and then the remainder which is everything that the school district has built into its budget that are not offsetting revenues, that's referred to as education spending. Um, and that's one of, when we talk about homestead property tax rates and how they vary by district, this is one of those big components that we're gonna come, keep coming back to, is that education spending number. So the school budget minus the offsetting revenues. And so then the state level. We've talked about this, statewide aggregated costs of public education includes all school budgets. That is not the um, federal categorical aid. And we can again think about two buckets. Here we can think about the education payment and that's just summed up all the education spending across the state, so across all school districts. And then there's everything else. So there's the categorical aid, there's one-time appropriations, um, and then there's other costs at the state level. You yes, asked the Senator Hashim on that, sir. What is categorical aid? Yes, so categorical aid are those dollars that are being, the, the term is often used off the top of the education fund, and those are dollars that are for a specific purpose that are going to a school district. So that's special education, state place students, um, I've got a whole list of them here. And we, Can you call it a block grant? Is it the same thing as a block grant? Um, essentially. So that's what. So that, so going into the Ed Fund Outlook to get to your question specifically, Senator, we see that all of the categorical aid here in lines eleven through um, nineteen. So I know that's small. See if I can make it bigger. We've got special ed, state place students, transportation, tech ed, small school. So, so some of these categorical aid areas are, they, I, I'm getting a sense they come from policy decisions that are made here mm -hmm. saying, all right, here's money for X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> and then the general expenditures, I think it was called, uh, those are coming from the local school boards which go to uh, teacher salaries and just all that stuff, all the other stuff. Yeah, so somewhere in the ballpark of 70, 80% of education spending I've heard is related to personnel costs. And of course, um, 
these are these are costs that the school district is building into its budget as this is what we have to spend or this is what we're choosing to spend um and there's no value judgment when when calculating the ed spending essentially it's just taking the school district's budget taking out these different pieces and then everything that's left over is education spending thank you all right so we already looked at this um this is a snapshot of the ed fund outlook which is kind of like a similar to an operating statement which spells out all of the the numbers in the ed fund this is what i'm presenting to way the means every week when talking about the modeling and it is posted on your website and we can walk through it in more detail um, if that would be helpful but it, this is just a snapshot of this is where all of the appropriations are listed out um, in the outlook so whirlwind tour of expenditures coming out of the ed fund um, now going into ed funding unless there's questions. Okay. Would you say that the Ed Fund has gone through in the past, and I'm not sure if you're able to answer this or not, but in the past 10 years, there's been an effort to remove things from the Ed Fund that might not belong there? I remember some of these conversations and a little bit of this work. So with respect to the the money that's coming out of the ed fund i would really need to sure. defer to policy yep. okay. in terms of why things have or have not fit into the ed fund great um so education funding we've already looked at this we can see those two buckets um we can see the sort of the breakdown of the way of thinking about sources that flow into the education fund so again with the whole two buckets <laughs> way of thinking about things here we can see the two buckets one is property tax the other is all of the other non-property tax revenue sources so as we as we spoke about earlier you've got x number of dollars that need to be paid out of the education fund or put into a reserve or any policy decision and then we have a number of non-property tax revenue sources. So that includes sales and use tax. It includes a portion of meals and rooms, a portion of purchase and use, lottery transfer, etc. So we've got all our expenditures. We subtract out all of those non-property tax revenue sources. And the remainder, um, just the, usually about two thirds of the dollars that need to, the funds that need to be made up are made up through property tax rates. So there's that flexible lever of the property taxes. Yes, sir, do I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. No, but, go. Um, I know, I believe recently, um, you joint fiscal did a study on income tax versus property tax based ed funding. Um, is that correct? So there was a study committee um, two summers ago yeah. made up of six legislators who looked into an income tax instead of a property tax. It was staffed by JFO Ledge Council, but it was it came from a group of legislators. Okay. All right, and I believe in the end there were no definitive answers or any definitive suggestions, but my, I'm wondering if JFO did a deep dive into what the two different two systems would look like, how different they would be or similar. Did that work get done? Yeah, so the committee was really looking at exactly that question. Um, and you know, our role is really to help policymakers answer questions. So one of the questions is, well, if there were to be an income tax, what would it look what would the structure of it be? So that was for the committee to discuss um, and there's a report that spells out the recommendations the big picture things that they looked at and a lot of supporting documents I'd be happy to share that with you if you're interested in looking through it in more detail I right, definitely and yeah. what and were there um, were you able to paint a financial picture in the end of what it would look like under a, an income tax system or there were some um, example <laughs> there were some, there were certainly examples and there was modeling that we did 
and um, the committee did not reach, um, I want to use the word consensus, but didn't necessarily get far enough along in the deliberations for there to be, this is what exactly what it would look like and this is what the rates would look like. For instance, the committee didn't say there are going to be X number of brackets and this is how much, these are the brackets that we want and these are the corresponding rates associated with those brackets. So there was some modeling that was like, here are a couple of different potential ideas based on the committee's um, requests. But they were not, but they were not recommendations. Right. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds to me like a generally like the work wasn't like fully fleshed out to to the extent where it would need to be to make any changes. Yeah, That's I would. Fair to say. I would defer to the legislators who serve on that committee. Ms. Richter, would you be the best person to just sort of take us through this, that report? I could certainly take you through the report. I think that would be great, right? Okay. It was staff. Um, Even if it's not. Completed. And the remaining staffer still around that also is not She can never leave. Uh, young man, sir, Paige, sir. Um, would you bring this to Senator Lyons? Okay. Uh, and Morgan? We'll yes. have, Morgan, would you have Ms. Richter in next week with that report? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Sure. That's great. Going back? Going back. <laughs> All right. Um, so going back, we're talking about education funding sources and revenues. So this is where they are on the Ed Fund Outlook. The revenues, um, this is, we've already spoken about this, the non-property tax revenue sources and the property tax revenue sources. And so now we're gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive into property taxes um, for I think the remainder of the slides that I've put together, how they work in general. So we've talked about how they're set to keep the education fund balanced. We've talked about that there's two property tax bases subject to the statewide education tax. It's important to note it is statewide, um, and that the rates differ by base, as as um, Senator um, asked about. So that's the non-homestead property and the homestead property. Here I've pulled out um, part of the definition of homestead, and it's that principal dwelling where someone lives the surrounding acreage. Everything else is not homestead. So we'll start on non-homestead because it's a little bit simpler. Um, this is in subject, if the property is non-homestead and subject to property tax, there are some properties that are exempt from property tax. Um, non-homestead property is subject to a uniform non-homestead property tax rate across towns at the equalized level. Um, and when I say equalized, that's important to note, that's talking about before the application of the CLA. Um, thinking back into what the CLA is, is essentially it's a tool um, because there's a statewide education fund and not all towns are appraising their properties at the same time or by the same person, there needs to be some tool to make sure that all properties are being taxed at a fair market value. So essentially what the CLA aims to do is it serves almost like a statistical reappraisal. Basically it's calculated annually by the tax department and it looks at, okay, what are the what are the um, properties appraised at in this town and what are properties actually being sold at in this town and calculates a ratio. And so that ratio is then used to adjust the tax rate. It could also be used to adjust the property value. It would mathematically be the same. That, that ratio is used to adjust the, the property tax rate to make sure that all of the property taxpayers across the state are paying 
their fair share regardless of where their town is in the appraisal process. Um, so a little bit of a rabbit hole, but I think it's important to context to have when thinking about the uniform non-homestead tax rate. So if everyone was appraised at farm, fair market value, there would be no CLA and everyone would be seeing the same non-homestead property tax rate on their bill. Getting back to your question, Senator, um, this non-homestead property tax rate is set in statute and it's annually not withstood by the legislature. It's set in session law. Usually it's referred to as part of the yield bill. Um, and this is part of that calculation process of how much do we need to raise and how much or how much um, does the General Assembly see for an average bill increase in non-homestead and an average bill increase in homestead. Um, and then I and, and others work to calculate those yields and rates using um, a yield model, which has all of this information in it. It's got revenue streams and grand list values and spending decisions. And um, it's a lot of work and a lot of data going into the calculation of a couple of numbers. So I'll pause there, because that's all I was planning on saying about non-homestead property taxes. Yeah, please. So there was some chatter about what comes first, the, uh, the budgets or the property tax rate. And I'm wondering <laughs> if you can just give a you know quick overview of that process. Yes. So careful, I'm going to scroll up in slides, so I don't want anyone to get motion sick. Um, I did, we ended up skipping over this to get into some of your questions, but this is a timeline that might be helpful. Okay. So. These two kind of go hand in hand. So school school boards and school districts, and um, I will defer to folks on the ground in terms of when that process begins. That's very outside of my bailiwick. But starting in the fall, I think, they're building and preparing those school budgets. Um, and then they will be warned. Um, and then, so those school districts and school boards are building their budgets and then statutorily on or before December 1st, the tax commissioner in consensus with the joint fiscal office and the agency of education needs to publish what's called the December 1st letter. And that is really a starting point for deliberations. It's written in the statute. This is how we have to calculate it. No policy decisions are made in that modeling. And it's based on the best available data, which is not great because we don't have school, school budgets yet um, and there's a number of other factors that will continue to be updated as the process rolls forward so that's the starting point and then March town meeting day school boards um, or school districts present their budgets voters vote on those budgets and then um, we continue to get better data and update it and then the legislature General Assembly then um, passes the yield bill to set the yields and the rates. Does that answer your question? It does. That's, that's really very Can I, May I editorialize just a little bit? Of, of course. Thank you. Um, which is just that it's really, really difficult for school boards and districts to try to make these decisions based on incomplete information. Yeah. Um, and also information that changes. We just had a whole bunch of budget scenarios and then the CLA came out and we had to completely change almost everything. So I, I just wanna, it's a shout out to the work that's done by districts and boards because it's very difficult without having the, all the information up front. Yeah. Are you willing to kind of put a little detail behind that? So, for example, the December 1 letter uh, forecasted something like a 20% or 18%? 18.5%. 18.5%, okay. So how does that affect you at the school board level when you're trying to develop a budget? Did you see that as a, as a benefit or a drawback that, that the rates would go up? Does that mean you get more cash in the end or does that mean that you're going into austerity? So. It, it complicates the story for sure because suddenly there's this 
letter saying that tax rates are going to go up, what was it, 18.5%, mm -hmm. whereas we're trying to, to build a budget to educate our students and pay our staff, et cetera. Right. Um, and so, and then, you know, you build out these scenarios, but in this case, the CLA, which I think just came out last week, mm -hmm. then further complicated the situation because we had made uh, assumptions based on different numbers. Because you have to, you do have to use some assumptions when you're doing the work, right? And, so, and that, the people that the, the voters have to approve the budget, right? You know, I haven't voted down four times because they people got angry when they saw eighteen and a half percent. And actually, even when you vote in March, there are still some decisions that come right. out later that will change so, things. So then, the eighteen and a half percent doesn't increase or doesn't. It doesn't necessarily reflect some of the special projects that you might have at the school board level, say for I don't know, say a new gymnasium or whatever. Well, the and the eighteen. I mean, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's also based on a bunch of assumptions. Right, right. I get the assumption bit. I mean, that's okay. I get that bit. What I'm saying, what I'm asking is, uh, uh, take taking the December one eighteen point five percent, and you as a school board member projecting building your own budget. Do you now then theoretically have to add on top of the 18 and a half percent if you're do, going to do a special project specific to your yes. district? Okay. Right. Yeah, I think it's safe to say yes to that question. Okay. All right. And and I think that a little bit of clarification may be helpful. And I can certainly not speak at all to school districts, school boards, the decisions that they are making. Um, Getting to the, the school construction question and the gymnasium, for instance. So because it's a statewide education fund, the cost of that gymnasium is going to fit within the school district budget, which is then going to flow into the statewide education fund. So there's not a separate pot of money that the school district needs to raise for a gymnasium or other construction projects. That's going to be baked into that education spending number. Statewide gets absorbed by everybody. Yes. Okay. And it gets absorbed by everybody who has a perfect segue back into homestead property tax rates <laughs> because local spending decisions, local um, per weighted pupil, impact the school district's homestead property tax rate. Um, so while it will be, while it impacts everyone, it most directly impacts the homestead property taxpayers in the school district. And we'll talk about how that, how the, the mechanics of that work here. So, is Rick Amaska? Yes. How often has the legislature said to school districts, you know, you, know, you cannot have more than five percent growth, ten percent? You know, you know, when you're looking at your, I remember. I think during the Shumlin administration, something there was a back and forth, of some kind. I may be misremembering it. So I'm not aware of that happening. I'm not saying okay. that it hasn't happened. I'm not, sure. I'm not familiar with a case where that happened because the structure really is that there's the local school district budgets that are being approved by local voters, and then they need to be funded um, with state revenues. Ms. Siklowski, does that sound familiar to you at all? And, and it might have been just a sort of a vague, hey, go back and take a look, dig a little harder, that kind of thing. It's ringing a little bit of a bell, but I don't think it was exactly as you described. Right. So right. we could look into the Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I can jump in also. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you. Um, so Homestead Property Tax. We've talked about how it's dependent on its locally approved education spending per pupil. We've talked about what that education spending number is, right? It's the budget minus the offsetting revenue. The remainder is the education spending. Um, I have words and a formula on this slide because my brain works in equations and I know that other people's brains work better with words. So both are saying essentially the same thing. Okay. Um, so I'm going to walk through the equation because that's, I think, a helpful place to start. So essentially what we're looking at here is, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Is 
the way that a school district's homestead property tax rate is calculated. Remember, this is before the application of the CLA. And so we've got a number of factors here that we're gonna just kind of walk through one by one. So what's highlighted in green is what varies by school district. Um, and then in the denominator here, we see the property yield. And so this is set annually at the statewide level. So how does this work? So we see that by school district, we're calculating the education spending. Oh, this is, sorry, this um, will be changing this coming year into long-term weighted ADM. Right. Um, we did not update that. But, um, so essentially what we have is we've got the education spending number being divided by, and I apologize, this should say long-term weighted average daily membership. Essentially, the number of kids on average who are sitting in the school plus all of the pupil weights that that school district receives based on its student makeup. So it's got, on average, how many butts are in chairs plus a factor called a pupil weight that accounts for kids who, students who may be more or less costly to educate. So that, those categories include English language learners, kids from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, kids at different grades, et cetera. So, so that's what we're seeing. That's all this green factor is, and it varies by school district. You throw the term long-term weighted daily. Average daily membership. Average daily membership. Yes. Um, and I will send an updated slide deck to Morgan so you have have that. That's what's coming in with the new um, yeah. Act 527. So that's that local adjustment factor. Um, and it's all divided by the statewide property yield, which is set annually by the legislature. So you can see how a school district's spending decisions and a school district's weighted pupils impact its property tax rate. This isn't saying this is how many dollars you get. Instead, it's saying this is how we're gonna calculate your property tax rate based on spending and weighted pupils. And then it's all divided by the statewide property yield, which is a number I calculate. I know it feels like a black box, but it's coming out of this model that's taking into account everything that's happening in the end fund and all the grant list values. Senator Weeks, you just touched on it, but the property yield, can you say that again? Sure. It didn't really resonate. Sure, so the statewide property yield, um, one way of thinking about it is if every school, um, so one way of thinking about it is the amount of education spending per a weighted pupil that would correspond with a dollar tax rate. So in other words, let's just pick some round numbers. Um, of, let's say that the, prop, the statewide property yield is 10,000, right? So if a school district had per pupil education spending of 10,000, mm -hmm. its tax rate would be a dollar. If it had per pupil spending of 11,000, it's greater than the property yield, so its tax rate would proportionately be adjusted upward to account for the amount it's spending greater than the statewide property yield. Is that helpful? Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the crux of it right here. Homestead property tax rates are um, adjusted by the local spending per pupil. And then also we'll recall the property, state, property yield is statewide. And so that's calculated to make sure there's sufficient revenues in the education fund. So because property tax rates are, about, are a function of spending, for people decisions or and not a function of um, property value in a school district gets back to the earlier point that we were talking about about a gymnasium and how that fits in yes it's going to increase the spending per pupil of the school district and we need to adjust the property yield to make sure enough money is being raised to fully fund that gymnasium.
as it's something that, from a local perspective, that uh, as a local select board and the town manager or board of aldermen are developing their budget in one room, school board is over here mm -hmm. de developing theirs. Never the twain shall meet in a lot of cases. So, uh, and but they're inter interrelated. So my experience as a select board member was that, you know, we're, we're always trying to keep the tax rate down because, the, you know, we don't want the taxpayers to have to hit a big increase. But there was always a, the question mark with what's the school budget for? So, because in my community, 81% of our property taxes go to pay for education funding. Mm -hmm. And every town's different. Yeah. So if I could ask again, uh, uh, oh, I just put me on the hot seat. Here. All right. So Burlington bonded for a school. Correct. Is that on top of this conversation? Oh yes. Is that a, just an additional? Oh yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. And that school bond fits into the education fund. So that's part of when we're calculating Burlington's homestead property tax rate. That school bond, that the annual payments for the bond fit into the budget and then flow through to the education spending number, which then flows through to the calculation of Burlington's homestead property tax rate. Okay, so to put it slightly differently, did, did the rest of the state essentially contribute to the bond? Yeah, yes. sure. Okay. Thanks. As a matter Thank of you. practice, that's uh, that's the way we've been. Yep. And that's kind of the eighteen and a half percent right there. Everybody's talking about it. that. That I remember one year it was going up eleven. That Pierce was treasurer. It's going to go up to eleven percent, and everybody tried to adjust for that announcement, and then they it actually went down to nine percent because they found some funding they didn't have. And this year we've got the. Uh, education tax over uh, surplus. It's got to go back to the taxpayers for education. So, so that 18 percent that has been announced includes that surplus going back in. So the 18 and a half percent, and I, it's an average bill change. Um, so that's the overall average estimated increase in liability. Um, it includes everything in the Ed Fund. So part of this, the assault, part of the statutory modeling requirements for the December first letter that we need to this year we needed to assume there was a tax rate offset reserve. The General Assembly set aside thirteen million dollars last year. We had to assume all $13 million were going to uniformly lowering tax bills. Same, all of the funds, the surplus you're referring to, the, the funds on the bottom line have also been applied to uniformly lowering tax rates. Following on my Senator, are you good? Yep. Okay. Weeks' question all regarding uh, <coughs> Senator Gulick's gym for the bonding. Yes. That. Well, it's Jim's next. Jim's next. The Jim's Jim's next. next. school. Yes, it's it's Prior to Act 60, we were on work. We weren't all chipping in. Yeah, and so exactly. Sure that's so that's right. that's something that um, is sometimes challenging in the discourse mm -hmm. of thinking sure. through this because of the way that education funding has changed in the mm -hmm. state over mm -hmm. the last 30, 30 40, 40 years. years yeah. um, so before there was a different education funding system where towns were relying on their own local grid list. Mm -hmm. um, in part, and the state would make up if they couldn't raise sufficient funds on their grand list. Um, and then there was the Brigham decision that said that that was unconstitutional. There needs to be um, an equitable funding. I would defer to Ledge Council to talk about the Brigham decision. But essentially, it led to this um, system where all school districts, regardless of their property wealth, have equitable funding opportunities. Senator Weeks and Senator Sheen. Yeah, just curious. So, what's the lever that uh, inhibits all of us from just bonding and then having having the cost dilute across the state? So, 
Um, again, a policy question. Um, the, the conversation has included um, the fact that property tax rates, homestead rates, in districts that are spending more are going to see a greater increase than homestead property tax rates in districts that are spending less per pupil. Um, historically, there was the excess spending threshold, which essentially was you know, school districts spending up to X amount um, or above X amount are gonna see a greater um, impact for those additional funds. Um, that was suspended during COVID and then further suspended in Act 127. Right. Um, but the, the direct link between spending right. decisions and um, how that's felt is in the Homestead property tax rate. Yeah. Thank Senator Sheeman and Senator Williams. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, just going back to uh, something that was brought up earlier regarding the surplus and having that go back to taxpayers, does that, when that does go back to taxpayers, is it to reduce the homestead or the non-homestead tax rate, and or is it both? Great question, and I know I keep saying this, but that's a policy decision. Okay. So, um, do you know what the current policy? So is it depends about? every year. So last year, I was asked to calculate the yields and the non-homestead rate so that the uniform bill change would be, so that the the bill change on average would be uniform for both homestead, non-homestead, and income sensitized taxpayers. And so it's up to the General Assembly. You could say, you know, we want to increase the average bill of this class X percent while decreasing the average bill of this class by X percent, as long as there were enough revenue raised to fully fund the Ed Fund. Yeah, so I, so I mean, I guess just generally a comment where we can, uh, I, I imagine, well, I imagine this is in the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. right? I mean, where we can, I would like to see it focused on the homestead tax rate for the folks who are currently living in our state rather than you know second homeowners but um, you know that, that is a policy decision for well it's, it's not just second homeowners it's also apartment buildings you mentioned. apartment buildings businesses it's every property that not needs to pay property tax that's not a homestead right right okay yeah senator williams and then senator Hewitt. so act 60 was the equity in education bill that was named so so when a school district has to cut back on the price per pupil that they're spending because of, of their their tax implications that kind of takes away from that equity in education or back to a rich town that can afford more they can have a higher um, that has more of a grand risk and have more uh, for to weight their pupil for per pupil spending than our, than our town does. So, would you say that's accurate? Do you mind rephrasing that last? I'm not uh, questioning him. I'm just. I just well, want to. You know, if uh, I'm just saying that <laughs> when Act 60 came out, there were a lot of towns that complained because the school district had a, had a really good school uh, program. They had all the perks, but once the state came in and got involved, they said, well, you can't do that anymore because we're gonna take that and give it to this school district that doesn't have as much. That's a kind of a generalization. But I mean, are wealthier districts well, still able to benefit from their wealth right. where poor districts cannot? So I would say that um, um, school districts can include in their school district budget what they see as what needs to be or should be included in their budget. So the state um, with Act 60 didn't say this school district can no longer provide, you know, this class or this service so that the money is taken and given over here. Instead it said, we're having an, a statewide ed funding system where your tax rate is going to be adjusted. And so if you, if the school district spends this much per pupil, then it will pay 
a higher rate than districts that spend less per pupil. Hence my 81% in my municipality of 60 and lot. So right, you're rough, you're rough in town. Correct. Yeah. But in the, it's a constitutional requirement that we provide an education for our children. Right. It doesn't say you're gonna pay property taxes to pay for it. Right, right. I, my question was actually just for Senator Hashim and we can speak offline, but I was just wondering if you if you would be willing to explain your what you talked about earlier that you think I Oh think with the uh, with non property. No non homestead. Oh with the uh, surplus going back. No, it was more about the burden of the funding being placed more heavily on the homestead tax folks. Did I hear that? Oh one? yeah, well yeah, I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, yeah. No, it was just a thought going back to the surplus that was mentioned earlier by Senator Williams, um, going back to taxpayers and whether or not that is used to lower homestead tax rates or non-homestead tax rates. Okay. And you know, my initial thought is, you know, right. what the first thing that pops into my mind when I think of non-homestead, I think of second homeowners. Um, but it also, as was mentioned, encompasses apartments, and so. And you know, landlords, property owners are going to offset the costs of property tax increases onto their tenants. Right. And so I'm just trying to think of you know what is the best way to you know evenly or equitably uh, try to relieve or mitigate some of uh, the tax burden for folks who are living in our state, uh, but. Like I mentioned, uh, apartment buildings fall under the non-homestead category. So. Thank you for clarifying. You that. want to question anything else? I appreciate that. Are it's you perfect. Sure? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And it's affected in the rent too because no, the yeah, rent I appreciate the clarification because I wasn't sure where the additional uh, rent yeah. payment. Yeah, and, and so I don't want to inadvertently then increase the tax rates for you know places that have more apartment buildings you know compared to. Plenty of single family homes, and so yeah, I feel like it's a kind of a balance right. or trying to find. Well, we haven't at we gave it this about an hour, so how so can you kind of can we do some closure kinds of things? Yeah, in so 10 minutes, and I, but I know Senator Weeks has a uh, question, question for Senator Gillick. Well, right. <laughs> turn on the spot. Please, yeah, this is, this Please. Is good. Right. yeah. Well, it's very good, it's a great okay. conversation. We might need to cover back. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to come back. Okay. I've gone through what I was today. hoping to go through instead yeah. of in terms of the level setting. I think one just helpful thing to add to She'll your conversation or your thought process is if you're looking to decrease the property tax um, burden. You've, there's a few different levers that exist within the education fund. One is to reduce expenditures. Mm -hmm. Where and how they're reduced is policy. Policy. Thank you. <laughs> you started, see where I'm going. Yeah. Starting here. Senator Hashim. Um, yep. Real quick, uh, reducing expenditures. I mean, earlier it was mentioned that 70 to 80 percent are personnel costs, right? So mm -hmm. is which, of education spending. Of education Sorry. spending. Okay, so regarding reducing expenditures, do you have uh, specific thoughts on which expenditures, or is that more so a policy? Firmly in the policy yeah. camp. Right. Um, in Act 127, we did have to publish a report. Um, part of it included um, doing research into methods for cost containment, like what the literature says. So that is a resource um, with respect to cost containment, and there's well, no. What was that report? I can I can share it with. Oh, are you talking okay. about that at three thirty? Any of that? I am not. Okay, you're zooming in though. When I'm Beth zooming is... in for a phone a friend. Phone a friend. Anthony okay. May. Yeah. Yes. Um, and we're happy to to talk about any anything. Great. Um, I think we're talking about Act One Twenty Seven. Right. So so just to fully close the loop. Um, so reducing expenditures, policy decision. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other option is changing the revenue into the end. So if, if you want to reduce the property taxes, either expenditures need to go down or 
um, change the revenue revenues source. need need to yeah. go up, or that maybe the data will come in and um, we'll see a different picture. Um, but changing revenue sources that would be you know changing revenue sources that are flowing into the education fund and or changing tax expenditures associated with those revenue sources and or adjusting property taxes and who's seeing which average bill. Can I suggest yeah, that we have um, Ms. Richter back in to dig into this a little bit more because it just seems like we're scratching the surface of what kinds of levers we have to kind of offset what's happening in the, right now and it, that's like another big conversation. Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. So next week, I think just on that specific yeah. sort of the, the levers, the what can, what are the possibilities that the legislature could do to address this? Yes. I mean, just we'll carve out that for that specific. So my quick question. Yeah, please. So back to the comment that uh, Senator Hashim made a moment ago, that uh, landlords typically pass on property, uh, property taxes to tenants. Why are apartment buildings not considered non-homestead? Why are they in the category of non-homestead? Being that they're- Policy. But, uh, okay, okay, I get that, but any anecdotal history or? Uh, I don't know. Just, It's a good question, well, I'm not sure. Senator, yeah. Senator uh, Hewlett? No, <laughs> <laughs> get the mirror out, right? <laughs> this has been terrific, yep. Great. really helpful. Morgan is going to have you back next week to talk about specifically around levers that we can pull. Uh, and then we also have, um, we had other, one other thing, Morgan, that you were going to put on the calendar. Education income tax. Education income tax. You there? Yes. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Let's take 10 minutes and we'll uh, shift gears. Thank you. And we'll come back to waiting. Welcome back to Senate Education. We're going to shift uh, our focus now to S204, an act relating to reading assessment and intervention. And we have um, Ms. Siglowski, Ms. Myers, and hopefully Mr. Nichols. Uh, we, this is listed as the agency response, but I don't think we, do we have anybody from the agency coming in, Morgan? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, they uh, they canceled it. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's get the agency response. Uh, let's push them to Friday, if you would. Okay. Okay, great. Ms. Siglowski, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Siglowski. I'm the executive director for the Vermont School Boards Association. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on S204. Um, VSBA has a shared commitment to improving student performance in reading. We work closely with our colleagues at the Vermont Superintendents Association, the Vermont Principals Association, uh, the Vermont Curriculum Leaders Association, and Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators to support better outcomes for students. I did submit written testimony. I um, know Morgan's having trouble um, uploading that, but you will have that um, when that's able to be added to your um, website. School boards support improved student outcomes, including literacy, by creating and sustaining conditions that support excellent teaching and learning. We do this by setting school policies, hiring and evaluating the superintendent, adopting measurable goals to support student academic progress, and by developing an annual budget that aligns with stated priorities and provides an equitable distribution of resources to help meet the goals that are set by the school board. We leave the how to our superintendents who under Vermont law are designated as the chief executive officer for the supervisory union or supervisory district. School boards rely on the professional expertise of their superintendents to chart the path for reaching the stated goals. In the area of literacy, um, I provided you with a couple of examples in my written testimony of goals that a school board could set based on the data that it has for its students. And the formula for these type of goals is to move students from X to Y by Z. So um, one of the examples I give is um, our school district will increase the percentage of students who are proficient or above in third grade reading as measured by the, and you insert whatever measurement you're doing, from X percentage in spring 2023 
to Y percentage in spring 2028. So that's an example of a goal that a school board might set, provide to their superintendent um, and you know, ask for a plan of how are we gonna get, to, um, how are we gonna accomplish this goal? Um, another example of a goal would be um, in our school district, the gap between all students and low income students in third grade reading achievement identified as non-proficient or partially proficient as measured by whatever the measurement is will decrease from X percentage in spring 2023 to another percentage in spring 2028. So you're trying to narrow that gap. Um, so once the goals are set, the superintendent puts a plan in place to achieve the goals and school boards monitor the results. School boards can also adopt policies if needed and they direct resources to meet the goals through their budget process. And school boards can use the superintendent evaluation process to hold the superintendent accountable for making reasonable progress towards those goals. S204 is a bill that gets at the how to improve student outcome and literacy. And as such, VSBA is very interested in VSA and VSPA's, um, sorry, in VSA and VPA's analysis of the bill. Um, so really, what is the legislature's goal? And then in VSA and VPA's professional opinion, does the, the bill provide the steps that should be taken to reach that goal? And I'm sure that um, Chelsea Myers and Jay Nichols will provide you with um, some more substantive in information about that in their testimony. Lastly, I would like to comment on the reporting requirement in the bill on page six, line 16, that requires each school board to annually report in writing to the Agency of Education on or before September 1st of each year, information on the prior school year by grade, school, and town. And I was just curious about why the bill assigns this responsibility to school boards rather than superintendents for the reasons that I laid out earlier in my testimony, my initial response is that it might be more appropriate to require the superintendent rather than the school board to submit the required reports. Thank you for your commitment to improving literacy outcome for Vermont students, um, and we certainly share that commitment. And uh, that concludes my testimony. So if I were to sort of do a little synopsis, correct me, so um, if I'm wrong, you're really interested, you support literacy, of course, the school boards, you're really interested in having the principals and the superintendents weigh in on this bill since the school boards really believe that these are the people that you're hiring to do this, to fulfill these obligations. Yes, okay. correct. Great. Yes, Senator Dulick. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, do you think it's fair to hold a superintendent accountable for progress or outcomes when he has been or she has been, or they have been um, victims, of, I'm gonna use the word victims, of a, of a sort of an inadequate system of teaching literacy or, or a system that clearly hasn't worked to its full potential? I mean, do you think it's, do you think that's fair? I'm just curious. Well, I think it's important when setting a goal to have a reasonable timeline so that um, the administrator has a chance to use the um, whatever tools they think are the proper tools in order to reach the goal. Okay. Um, I just wonder what happens when the tool that we think was the best tool turns out it was not the best tool and, and we have you know new learning and new understanding and, and shifting science around what's best. It just, it, to me, Again, as you guys hear me say this multiple times every day, but as someone on a school board, I, I don't feel comfortable um, trying to measure my superintendent's success, especially around literacy, when from everything I've learned points to the fact that we've been doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And we didn't necessarily know that we were doing it wrong, but we're realizing now as we kind of peel back the layers that there's just been some faulty I don't even want to say science because I'm not sure it was science, but faulty pedagogy. Um, so anyway, that's that's more of just like a rhetorical thing I wanted to say. You don't need to answer that per se. But. Do you have a sense, may I ask you if that's happening out there? Is that what? the superintendents are losing their jobs because of 
reading scores not being... I don't think they're losing their jobs, but to Ms. Zaglowski's point, that is our job as a school board. Like, we are there to assess the success of a superintendent. Yeah, so it is, it is part of our yeah. job. It's a big part of our job mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. to evaluate outcomes and success. Yeah. yeah. So who sets the policy for the techniques for teaching reading? I mean, is it the AOE? Well, I mean, we're considering, we're looking right. at one right now, yeah. yeah. So let's say that superintendent, when they oh, in terms of decide, design. Right, they decided to go with hooked on phonics, and that wasn't the latest teaching method. He jumped up and down, he probably would have got fired for that. You know, it's, it's, you're, I get your point. Your point is that uh, uh, you deal with hand your dealt, and if it didn't pan out, then you can be replaced. Yeah. Tough, tough business. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chelsea, yeah. That was to support your point. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 There's something I wanted to say, but I didn't I say it. We can talk yeah. later, I guess. Um, I also submitted my testimony to Morgan and okay. I was informed that it wasn't there. There are some like links to resources, so I recommend looking at the virtual offering. Um, thank you for inviting testimony from the Vermont Superintendents Association on the important topic of reading instruction and outcomes. Quite frankly, literacy is a human right and foundational to being a lifelong learner and all Vermont leaders should treat it as such. First, my name is Chelsea Myers. I am the Associate Executive Director of the Vermont Superintendents Association, and this testimony has been reviewed and contributed to by several superintendents and a reading specialist. <coughs> Early in my career, I had the privilege of serving as the lab manager of the Laboratory for Educational Neuroscience at the University of California, San Francisco, where I conducted neuroscience research on early literacy development, publishing in peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. The testimony I aim to provide to you today will, one, speak to literacy policy and reform overall, and two, speak directly to the proposed legislation. And I do have some suggestions, and those are in the spirit of collaboration, not to say we oppose it at all, but just to help um, inform some of the language. And I should mention, uh, <coughs> Ms. Myers was incredibly helpful when we did Act 28. I don't know about that, but I- Incredibly helpful, yes. <laughs> um, The literacy transformation <laughs> bill that we did two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first section is titled Equity and Culturally Responsive Pedagogy. Equity must be at the forefront of this work. Data indicate that students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, BIPOC students, English language learners, and students with disabilities are disproportionately not getting what they need from the system to succeed in learning to read and write at the benchmark set for all students. Equitable access to high quality instruction must be a top priority in supporting this work. This is particularly challenging given the workforce shortages of highly skilled professionals in some regions of the state. VSA actively participated in the Ethnic and Social Equity Standards Advisory Working Group for its duration. Reading instruction is interwoven into the principles of creating culturally responsive and inclusive environments for all students. The availability and use of texts that are culturally relevant and representative of historically underrepresented voices is critical to ensure that all students can connect their experience to the text they are reading. Though often unintentional, implicit biases impact the expectations for students, expectations for students impact the way that educators interact with students, and ultimately are correlated with student achievement. For these reasons, we ask that the Senate Education Committee consider ways in which the, leg the legislature can support the successful implementation of the anticipated revisions to the uh, education quality standards, which came from that group. The next segment is um, titled Early Learning. Learning to read and write starts long before first grade and has long lasting effects. Learning to read and write is an ongoing process from infancy. Contrary to popular belief, it does not suddenly begin in kindergarten or first grade. From the earliest years, everything that adults do to support children's language and literacy is critical. And that's from the NEAR report in 2006. Um, early language and other literacy skill development is of utmost importance to later literacy and achievement. For this reason, comprehensive literacy policy should focus on these earlier years. 
For example, policy considerations could include looking at early learning standards related to literacy across the pre-K delivery system. Are they consistent with research in early language and literacy development? Are they consistently applied? Providing, um, second, providing training and support for early childhood educators in evidence-based early language and literacy skill development and screening. And third, considering elements of programs like City Providence Talks that aim to close the word gap. The next se segment is teacher preparation. The report, Early Literacy in Vermont, findings from the Vermont Education Educator Preparation Program course syllabi review, commissioned in Act 28, found that 60% of educators recommended for certification in early childhood, early childhood special education, and elementary pathways are served by the six educator prep programs studied by the researchers. Just nice. one moment. Yeah. Uh, Morgan, committee members are really wanting to see this document. I think uh, Yes, uh, I, will, uh, I will resend the email, I'm sorry. Uh, I would just send it with just the, yeah, that would be great. I think I may have found it. Okay. No, maybe not. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thus, focusing on educator preparation programs in Vermont could be an influential policy lever since it um, accounts for 60% of those educators serving our students. Generally, the survey in the report found that the six educator prep programs covered the six key com reading components. However, reports from the field suggest that many educators are not confident in their ability to teach reading, and education administrators and anecdotally report a decrease in the readiness of early career educators as they leave higher education institutions. This might be related to the pedagogical intensity findings found in the report. So please consider further investigating pre-service programs in Vermont as a policy lever. And then I link a report from the Education Commission of the States outlining policies that other states have employed in this pre-service arena. Early screening intervention in Act 173 is the next segment that I'll talk about. Research underscores the critical significance of early literacy screening and intervention in shaping children's educational trajectories. Studies consistently demonstrate that early identification of literacy challenges significantly improve outcomes. Early screening, as proposed by this bill, has a twofold purpose. One, identifying struggling students, and two, also informing the system of the efficiency of their tier one instruction. So tier one is that universal general education instruction. For the latter purpose, the district management group's report titled Expanding and Strengthening Best Practice Supports for Students Who Struggle, which laid the foundation, again linked in the, the virtual version, uh, which laid the foundation for Act 173 of 2018, said the following. For districts with large numbers of students through small group or individual Tier two, sorry, or individual tier two or special education. In, I see the line. My yeah. gosh, sorry. <laughs> For districts with large numbers of students who are not meeting goals, it's not desirable or practical to serve all students through small group or individual tier two or special education interventions. Many of these students can and must be helped through improvements in primary universal tier one instruction. So that's again high quality general education instruction. A core underpinning of the multi-tiered system of support, MTSS, model is that extra interventions serve 10 to 15 percent of, of students. Across the state of Vermont, approximately 45 percent, this data is a little bit old, of students did not score proficient in ELI on the state assessment grades 3 through 5 for the 25 through 2016 school year. Investing in the effectiveness of core reading instruction is critical for students in general education and students with disabilities and can ultimately reduce the number of students in tier two and special education reading interventions. That's not to say to leave them behind, it's talking about the efficiency of that tier one instruction, that putting resources into that tier one instruction is an important part of um, the whole literacy system. Um, and that quote is from the district manager group first part. Please. Questions? Do you, you want to finish? No, go for it. Um, I'm just curious if when you look at, um, I'm still getting to know this numbers, S204? Yeah, S204. Yeah. Do you see this as a, as a bill that is primarily in tier one? Um, 
Yes. Yeah, me, okay, me too. I was just curious if we were on the same page. It, yeah. I mean, it does influence the other tiers yeah. um, when you identify students who are struggling, mm -hmm. but screening is really looking at, A, that universal instruction, how are we doing, in, and that's when you take it in the aggregate. Um, and then also to figure out what interventions might be appropriate for a student that is not being served well by the tier one instruction. So it's kind of twofold in that way. Yeah. So. Right. And then, I mean, and then, sorry, another question. This gets kind of pedagogical, but um, could do you foresee where like the tier two targeted instruction could take place in a sort of just like within a tier one differentiated <coughs> model? I would defer to a reading specialist. Okay. My sense is that that would still potentially be considered tier one in certain circumstances and sometimes tier two, depending on the intervention, but please don't quote me on that. Go for okay, no, I, I think we're on the same page so far, yeah, okay. thank you. Investing in universal instruction is an imperative for sporting improvement in reading achievement. Early assessment tools can and should inform systems on how to improve tier one instruction. What does investing in universal instruction or tier one instruction look like? Ensuring that educators are equipped with the training and coaching support necessary to provide high quality reading instruction to all students. The purpose of S204 significantly overlaps with the principles that were foundational to Act 173 of 2018. A law that was grounded in two robust studies and laid out an implementation plan and technical support from the field. Despite a well-crafted piece of legislation, there have been significant challenges with state level support for implementation, seen in both the professional learning requirements for the Agency of Education and the rulemaking process, which did not live up to the expectations of flexibility for the field. This is to say that Act 173 is an excellent and comprehensive systems approach for serving students who struggle and a valuable policy lever. BSA asks that you consider doing a deeper dive into the history and present day of Act 173, monitor whether state stack stakeholders have fulfilled their responsibilities under the law, and reinvest in successfully implementing the best practices that laid the groundwork for that legislation. So now specific to S204. Thank you to the sponsors of this specific bill and the Senate Education Committee for their commitment to ensuring that we improve reading outcomes for students in Vermont. The following is specific feedback related to the proposed legislation. And again, this is in the spirit of collaboration. It is not in any way saying that we oppose sure. the bill. Um, I do go like certain line, page, line, just to let mm -hmm. you know if you have the bill open. Um, please take testimony from school district administrators and the Agency of Education about how this bill fits within the context of the larger education delivery system, including but not limited to local comprehensive systems, MTSS, sorry, local comprehensive assessment systems, MTSS, Act 173, and IDEA. Any new initiative should align within the context of these existing educational structures. The requirements laid out in S204 require significant training and expertise at a time when school districts are contending with very notable workforce shortages. That is to say, increasing the information that we have about students by means of early screening is important. However, screeners are only as good as the knowledge, expertise, training, and experience of those administering the screeners, interpreting results, and providing instruction and interventions. Publish list of approved screeners from the Agency of Education. So that's page two, line 11. The superintendent that informed this testimony agreed that having a list of universal screeners at no cost to school districts could be a helpful resource. They expressed concern about the limited expertise at the Agency of Education, which did expand under F28, but might not be sufficient to lead significant reading reform. Please consider adjusting the language to the following. The Agency of Education shall identify and publish a list of approved universal screeners, reading screeners in consultation with no fewer than three school district-based reading specialists. The universal screeners and screeners for dyslexia characteristics, um, that language on page two. The current language switching between universal screeners and screeners for dyslexia characteristics is dif difficult to follow and distinguish. Screening is a critical component of an effective MTSS and a solid comprehensive assessment system as part of an MTSS can and must adequately screen for literacy skills. 
However, universal screening, as defined by the International Dyslexia Association, is used to determine a risk, a student's risk for reading difficulty and the need for intervention. This is inclusive of, inclusive of but not exclusive to, dyslexia. Please consider revising the language in S204 to say, at risk for experience reading dif difficulties, or at risk for experiencing reading difficulties, including risk of dyslexia. Senator Williams. Let's see, what is MTSF? Multi-tiered system of support. So that is um, referring to kind of what we've been talking about with the core instruction, like with right. what you would get in a, a kind of regular classroom setting, and then intervention strategies are the, the, the subsequent tiers. Yeah. Um, page four, line five, a dyslexia, sorry, a dyslexia screener will be administered when students show deficits in reading and spelling words despite receiving evidence-based instruction. How are deficits defined in the context of a dyslexia screener? How will a dyslexia screener fit within the context of diagnostic evaluation and the rights of students under IDEA, or the rights of students to qualify for an IEP? The characteristics outlined on page two and three of S204 should be properly vetted by school district-based reading specialists and informed by evidence. This is outside the scope of my expertise and the testimony that I can provide today. Page three, line 10, please consider revising this wording to um, inform the instructional strategies for students in need of additional support. Gets rid of, um, or suggests getting rid of a little bit of that language in there to just um, allow for flexibility within the system in terms of how they address those needs. Page four, line 13, what does more regularly mean in this context? Um, and then individual reading plans. VSA recommends that the committee learn more from administrators and educators about how an individual reading plan fits within the context of personalized learning plans and IEPs. If this is too tedious to do this line by line, please stop. This is helpful. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. It's yeah. Really helpful. Um, we will have you in again, but this is helpful. Okay. Yeah. As we do mark up. I realize it was a lot. Conversations. Yeah. Page four, line ten. Um, at this time, VSA recommends focusing on what it must include or what the intervention must include, rather than what it may not include. You're talking about the queuing system, and one of the reasons we suggest that is there's current pending case law. Um, around a state that had banned a particular methodology. So if we do outline what we want, that will for sure be included in the strategies that um, educators are using. Um, and I did link to a little bit of information about that case law at the end of the document as well. Um, page 16, line 6. Please consider changing school board to school district. Um, Sue outlined the reasoning for that and the, whose responsibility it is. That's page six, I think, right? Not oh, six. I'm sorry, yes. That's okay. Typo. Page seven, line four, how is deficiency defined? Um, Vermont educator preparation programs, implementation of reading instructional programs on page seven, line 13. As specified earlier in the testimony, educator preparation as a policy lever is of interest to VSA. How would this be monitored and assessed? So thank you for including that in the bill recommendations. And I'm just wondering in more detail how that would um, come about. Um, and then on page eight, line nine, it says a school reading specialist shall provide while VSA agrees wholeheartedly with the intent of this provision, not every school has a reading specialist, as defined by someone holding a reading specialist certification. Perhaps the committee could consider expanding the definition to include other professional credentials. At its essence, this gets at the recommendation found in the GM DMG report for students who struggle to receive instruction from highly skilled educators. The early literacy screening guidance from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is a comprehensive, in its link there, is a comprehensive tool that addresses many of the points that I surfaced in this testimony in, um, I think, a really great way and could be a useful tool when considering the revisions offered today. The guidance is in support of Massachusetts regulations, Regulation 603 CMR 28.03 
which requires schools to screen students' reading ability from kindergarten to third grade at least twice per school year, use uh, DESE approved screeners, determine appropriate actions, and notify parents within 30 school days. So some parallels with their uh, law uh, and this bill. Um, a comprehensive approach to improving reading outcomes will work to ensure that quality instruction is happening across the state, that our teachers have the skills they need to teach reading, and that our intervention systems have the skills and resources needed to address those who struggle. Thank you to the committee for examining this issue. BSA shares your concern about the state of reading in Vermont. There are a number of reading specialists, special educators, curriculum directors, and superintendents who would be great assets in informing how to address the state of reading in Vermont. I would be happy to connect you with those experts. A short video is linked for your consideration about how reading policy evolved in 2023 and what's ahead. Thank you. Reading policy nationwide? Nationwide, okay. yes. Yeah. It does talk about that lawsuit yeah. around the three QA method. Okay. This has given us a lot to chew on, a lot of possible witnesses. I would, if you would email Morgan, Sure. And copy uh, Senator Bulick, she's the sponsor, the sponsor, and myself on some witness ideas. That would be great. Specific names, anybody. When you say superintendents, folks yes. like that. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Okay. I do have one. Yeah, yeah. Please for jump Lindsay. in. Um, and I don't. This may not be the time for it, but it'd be helpful if at some point, if um, possibly you or someone um, at the BSA could speak to, um, I'm trying to find where this question was, um, basically professional development. What, what Was that your second bullet point? What was that? The training needed for yeah. to be able to administer and right. properly utilize the screen. Yeah, so I was yeah. just wondering if someone could speak to the training needed to really bring this to fruition and really give it teeth and you know make it a success if we if we are able to go in this direction uh, but also just like inform our committee on what kinds of professional development opportunities are out there are available what do schools require of their teachers mm -hmm. um, what kind of monies are available to teachers for you know all of that would be I think really helpful to give us a little bit of context around what's possible Yes. That would be great. I'd be happy to. And Thank also you. in that um, Massachusetts report, they outline a framework for professional learning around the screening to just, I think, helpful. Great. More broadly, the specificity I can certainly bring right. people Cause just from, the table. Yeah, from, a, from my perspective, it seems as though school districts have both time and resources sort of baked into their schedules now for specifically for um, professional development, so that could be a really nice opportunity to do some of this work. Yeah, I'd yeah. be happy to bring, okay. recommend some folks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry you for the around? tedious line by line. No, it's no, actually a good it's testimony. So it's helpful. Great. We can go back. We can reference it. It's great. It's helpful. And feel free to stay right where you are. Jay is okay. zooming in. Hey, Mr. Nichols, how are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? Yeah, yeah. Doing well. Uh, so uh, do you have, I know you have testimony. It has been emailed to us. It should be close to the top. It's from uh, Morgan. Um, this is from the Vermont Principals Association. We're gonna turn, we're gonna turn up the volume. Hold on. How's that? Uh, say something, Jay. Hello, how are you? Uh, no. One more time. Hello, how's everybody doing? That's not doing anything. I was just doing this volume down here. Um, Morgan, how do you uh, turn up the uh, volume? It, it should just be the, the little um, on, in the bottom right of the iPad down there. Okay. How's that, Jay? I can hear you folks perfectly. All right. Let's, we'll, let's, yeah, let's, let's go with that. Okay. okay. Floor is yours. Do you want me to share my screen? Sure. Well, we have it right in front of us. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so I, I'll be brief. Um, I would like to, for the record, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. I'd also like to say for the record, whenever we have anything to do with literacy from now on, I'd prefer to testify before Chelsea Myers so I don't look as bad. 
Chelsea and I did talk last night. I did tell her I was going to say something like that. So first, uh, thank you, Senator Gulick and, and Hashim, for signing on to this bill and the Senate Education Committee in general for your strong interest over the last few legislative sessions and looking to assist schools in improving instruction and ultimately outcomes and reading performance for our students. Nothing is more important in the academic realm than helping kids become good readers by the end of third grade. Uh, in the first section, the VPA supports the concept of universal screeners to be identified and published by the Agency of Education. We ask that while the agency continues to identify appropriate screeners, which they've already done some work on, they take careful stock of what districts already have in place on universal screeners. Systems that have effective screening mechanisms already in place should not have to make unnecessary changes. Screeners being available at no cost is very important as it ensures we don't unwittingly disadvantage school districts with less financial resources. And to that point, there will be human resources involved too. Um, you know, with people doing the work and any training that's necessary, but anything you can do to mitigate the financial costs of the actual screeners will be very useful. The requirements uh, for the screener are aligned with previous work that resulted in Act 28 of 2021 and is supported by the work of the Advisory Council on Literacy. I'm especially heartened by the requirement that the universal screening process be brief. Uh, when I was in superintendent, we were using Fontis and Pinnell, Pinnell type assessments, and we were spending 45, 50 minutes at a time on a kid, individual kids. So teachers were out of the classroom trying to do the assessment, and then you can't be instructing the rest of the kids at the same time. So I'm hopeful that these universal screeners will be very helpful. Obviously, there'll be some students that will need additional screening, and in some cases, further diagnostic assessment. However, a strong universal screener can easily assist professional educators in a manner that can change instruction to better meet the needs of each individual student and focus on any reading deficiencies that should be addressed sooner rather than later. A couple of con concluding thoughts related. Uh, one, I think it makes sense to make sure the Advisory Council on Literacy does not sunset. Uh, with research and application changes in the field of reading, which have been happening since the 1970s, it's important to have a group who oversees and continues to make sure that literacy improvement is front and center in Vermont. And uh, I didn't mention here the language in the last sentence that says which a school reading specialist shall provide might be too uh, restrictive. School reading specialist is an actual endorsement in the state of Vermont. I'd feel more comfortable with language that is less restrictive. The key is that the services are provided by someone who's qualified to provide those services. Uh, again, I'm a big fan of reading specialists, but I don't want someone to inadvertently, uh, something to inadvertently occur that would actually restrict potential services to students because the school could not get someone with that endorsement. And then my final comment, subject to any questions, is uh, let's be very careful about prescribing anything that would be considered curriculum or requiring a certain program to be used. I know you're not trying to do that here, but there are a ton of commercial for profit groups out there that sell screening programs, curriculum packages, uh, make billions of dollars, who claim to be able to produce better reading results. And often they develop their own paid for research that supports their product. So let's try to make sure that we're really careful of that as we go down this path. Uh, with reading. The only other thing I wanted to say, um, Chelsea had talked a little bit about, I caught the end of her testimony, um, about um, the language in there being, making sure the language is not restrictive throughout. She made some very good suggestions. And I know there's going to be more conversation and testimony on this. I know you've had Gwen Carmoli in already to testify. I think she's a very strong person to have testify again to talk about specific attributes that Chelsea brought up. And I would consider it really important that you, again, keep this advisory council moving forward and reading. I think it's one one program. I hate committees that last forever. This is probably one that probably should. And that's all. Great. Anything else for Mr. Nichols? Great testimony, both of you. Thanks a lot. Thank we have you. A lot of work to do, but I feeling really good that we'll, we'll, we'll confident that we'll get there. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this, folks. We do appreciate it. Appreciate you. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate that. Well, am I supposed to talk about 127 or am I all set? You're welcome to stay on for uh, 127 if you want to. You mean Act 127? Uh, people waiting. Yeah. Why don't you stick around? We're going to take a, we're going to come back here in about 10 minutes, why don't you stick around if you'd like to weigh in a little bit, that'd be terrific. We'd appreciate okay, it that. it should be very, very short. Yep, that's fine. Okay. And Morgan, if you would take us off. Absolutely, one moment.
All right, you're off. Okay, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, last 45 minutes or so, we are going to start a conversation about waiting. And uh, senators may or may not recall, let me just pull up my agenda here, I apologize. Uh, Act 127 was passed, I think two years ago, an act relating to improving student equity by adjusting the school funding formula and providing education quality and funding oversight. And I've asked Ms. St. James to update us. Well, he, we have update and walk through uh, the bill. This is really what we would like Ms. St. James to do is tell us what the bill was supposed to do bring us back to two years ago as much as she possibly can. We also had Ms. Richter here to weigh in, and I've asked, to, or Jane Nichols was nice enough to volunteer to stick around a little bit. So, uh, Ms. St. James. Thank you. Uh, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, I understand there might be some tech issues this afternoon. So I had sent, do you all have a copy of Act 127? No? Okay. Um, we can do a couple different things. I made a high, I made an outline that was mainly for myself, but when I realized there might be some tech issues, I cleaned it up a little bit. And so if you all would like copies of that, I can pass that out. I have copies for you. Um, it's kind of an outline of the bill. Um, and or I can share my screen with, with the app. Paper copies, well, please. Okay, so for I sure. don't have the app, I just have the outline. Yes, I think okay. we'll start with okay. that. Yeah, well, and I, my more. question is, is why am I not able to find this on? Are you in the correct session? Yeah. Would it, so it's not going to show up in 23 and 24 as an no. act? No. Nope. 22, 2022. You, if you are on the legislative homepage, if you go up to bills and resolutions, and then you click on search, bill, act, and resolution search. Yeah, on the left hand corner, do you see where it says change session? Yep. Uh, no, I know how to do oh, all okay. that. I just, I thought once an act was an act, it was sort of available in all sessions, but apparently I not. thought so too. Okay. Nope. Okay. Um, okay. So here, and again, this was originally intended for me only. Thank you. So keep that in mind, please. And I will send a copy to Morgan to post. Sorry. So, Act 127 came out in, um, I've been saying bills come out as if they are movies, so I, I apologize for that. Um, it was enacted in uh, 2022, so not that long ago, and um, it contains at the very beginning, which is not referenced in my little summary, um, a couple pages of findings. Um, and so it starts with a reference to the Brigham decision, which if you all remember, it's from 1997. And to just simplify it down to its simplest form, it was the state Supreme Court um, really committed, excuse me, excuse me, making it clear that is a state obligation, education is a state obligation, and that in order to fulfill its constitutional obligation to provide education, the state must ensure substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout Vermont. So then that led to a series of funding changes. And you all remember we talked about Act 60, we talked about Act 68 last session. Um, and then we were in the education funding landscape that we were in prior to really July 1, 2024, because what we're about to talk through doesn't most of it doesn't take effect. The, the meat of what we we're about to talk about doesn't really take effect until July 1, 2024. But it is being used now as schools are calculating their budgets for the next school year. So it is very relevant. So the findings really talk about um, that substantial equality of education concept and how we fund education in this, for, in this state. Um, in 2019, there was a uh, report commissioned um, by the legislature to look at um, pupil weights are um, weights apply applied to student counts. That's a very uh, simple way to put it. To account for 
the differences in costs of educating different students with different needs or circumstances, right? So generally speaking, a elementary student is going to cost less to educate than a high school student. And how do you account for that, right? If, if it's not a one-to-one, -one, how do you account for that when you are trying to figure out your education spending? You will, in this state, we apply what we call pupil weights. And one of the main, one of the main things that Act 127 did, and what we'll talk about, is it updated those weights. So in 2019, there was a study commissioned to look at Vermont's weights and see if there were um, changes necessary. And then there was a task force created. I don't believe anyone on this committee was on the task force. Okay. There was a pupil weighting task force um, that um, occurred in the summer of summer fall 2021, and they came out with recommendations. And then in 2022 session, the legislature created at what became Act 127 and updated those weights um, and made some other changes that we will touch on. So. The goals of this act are laid out at the very beginning, um, and that is to ensure students receive substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout the state. And then there's some more specifics there, but in the interest of time, I'll just skip over them, but just know that there are some goals spelled out in the act itself that you should, if you're interested in that, take a look at. And then my handout, um, starts with the intent of the act. So this act updates and adds new pupil weights for fiscal year 2025 and thereafter. Remember, fiscal year starts June, July 1. So if it's fiscal year 2025, that starts July 1, 2024. Um, so uh, this. Yeah. Oh, do, you, do people want the bill on the screen? I'm happy to share. I don't know that I have a. I just wonder if, like, if anyone's watching, tuning in, they might want to be following along the bill. Well, there's four of us on the, on the, uh, only four on the monitor. Only four logged in. If Morgan wants to send me a Zoom link and give me your permission, I'm happy to sure. share. But if you uh, Morgan, will you send a Zoom link, please? Absolutely. Do you want me to wait for that or keep going? Please keep going. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, at, uh, sorry, section one of the bill was a finding section. Section two of the bill were the goals, and section three was the intent section. And section four starts the substantive changes to law. So, section 4010 in Title 16. Um, was formally called, or is currently called, Determination of Weighted Membership. And you'll see that as of July 1, 2024, which is when this section takes effect, this section will be called Determination of Weighted Long-Term Membership and Per Pupil Education Spending. And this is, for lack of a better way of putting it, where the weights live. Um, so this section, section four, is, um, there are, there's lots of meaty sections to this bill, but when we're talking about the weights, this is, this is it. So I just got the Zoom link, bear with me. So this is um, page five, section four, that's the title. And this is, we're in title 16 in the green books, which is your education title. We're in the very last chapter, which is chapter 133, and it is, that is the education funding chapter. Um, so you can see this was the old law, it's all been crossed out. I'm gonna start here with some new definitions. And I'm going to jump right into the weights. So um, the, 
we can talk mechanics after I'm going to point out the weights first. Uh, so the weights start on page eight. So let's see, not eight. Did I start on page eight? There we go, page 10. So what this section does is it requires each school district to report to AOE every year certain uh, by a certain category, the number of students in each of these categories. Uh, and it's a little more nuanced than that, but I'm just going to talk broad strokes here. And I'm sure Julia is cringing as I say that. Um, so these are, you'll see this is all underlined. These will be the new weights that take effect July 1, 2024. But as I said, they are being used now to calculate the fiscal 2025 budgets. So the pre-kindergarten weight was actually not changed. Um, that is work to be done if that is going to change. You'll see we go right from pre-K to grades six through eight with a weight of 0.36. So what happened to grades K through five? Well, they're not listed here because they have a weight of zero. <laughs> so then grades through nine have a weight uh, of, of 0.39, and then um, those are the, the grade weights. Then we get into some different weights, and I think my handout is a little easier to read, at least for me, on what those categories are. So there's a poverty weight um, for pupils whose family is at or below 185% of the federal um, poverty level. And those students will receive an additional weight of 1.03. Then there is an EL weight, which is for English learners. And we'll, there's a whole separate section. There's a, there's a small separate section of categorical aid for certain school districts with EL learners. But all EL pupils will receive an additional weight of 2.49. And then there is what we're calling the sparsity weight. And I should say, everything I've just talked about, the weights, they already existed in current, they exist in current law. Act 127 updated them, changed them, except for free camp. Varsity weights, I'm on, I'm right here on subdivision four here, are for pupils living in low population density school districts. And you can see um, on page 11 of Act 127 is where those weights live. I've pulled them out, so if it's, um, if the number of people per square mile is fewer than 36 people. It's a weight of 0.15. The number of persons, and this is just people living in the area. There's a whole separate weight for small schools themselves. So this is the geographic area where the students live, and then there's a whole separate weight for schools. Um, so you can see those weights. That's a new weight that was added in Act 127. And the small school weight was also added in Act 127. So for pupils who attend a small school, if the school is less than 100 pupils, uh, they have a weight of 0.21. And if it's 100 to 249, those are what are considered small schools. It's a weight of 0 0.07. So what we're going to School districts are required to report the number of students in each of those categories to AOE every year. Um, AOE applies those weights, and it's um, you've got your number of students just flat out, right? So let's say you have eight students, eight pre-K students. You would apply the pre-K weight of point negative 0.54 to those eight students. And then you would get, and then so the number of weighted pupils for pre-K would be eight plus that weighted number, and that would be your weighted number. So you're going to do that for all of those categories and then add them together. Um, Julia, have I said anything that needs correction before we go on? Uh, Julia Rector, Joint Fiscal Office. Nope, sounds great, Beth. Center Weeks. So my assumption is that these weights take into account all the facilities and labor costs associated with, with those education. So there was a study done, and the study, and then the study committee looked at all of that. That was um, actually a little before my time. Um, 
I would be happy if you wanted me to come back or you, it would actually be better to hear from the author of those reports. But yes, those are some of the things they studied is what, what goes in, what's the cost of educating students in those different categories? I don't know that I can say yes or no to that because mm -hmm. I don't know what total cost means. Um, well, to my constituents, I mean, it's total cost of educating each pupil. So there's regarding a, all these different. So areas. there's a diff. So this is not education spending. So the district's budget, and this is really Julia's area to shine. And so if I see your camera, come on, Julia. I know I'm going astray. Um, but the school districts are going to come up with their budgets. And then in order to get per pupil spending, which is I think what you're getting at, Senator Weeks, is that all in cost on educating your kiddos, there's some additional math that happens. Um, these weights we're using um, to set property tax rates. Yes. Um, this is dense sure. and complicated. Very just very quickly, so these weights set property tax rates. They are used to set the property tax rates. So in a town that has fewer students, that 0.15, for example, will be used, or actually, I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question, so I think I'll wait. But. So the weights give school districts taxing capacity mm -hmm. to draw from the education fund to, uh i i guess so so um the weights will give a school district taxing capacity but it does not dictate how they spend their money or how much they are going to spend on their pupils so um I don't know, this might be a great place for Julia to jump in to explain the taxing. I, there's also my counterpart, my counterpart, my colleague Kirby Keaton is our tax attorney. Mm -hmm. And so education funding is a combination of me, um, our education or our tax attorney and um, Julia Richter at JFO. Um, and I feel slightly out of my wheelhouse sure. today trying to explain how the property tax rates are set. Um, but the pupil weights are part of the equation to arrive at the property tax rate, but they they are not an indication of how much the school district is spending or how or um, uh, where they're making their spending choices. Julia, do you want to jump in? I'm happy to jump in if that would be helpful for the committee and or for you, Beth. I just want to make myself available. Jump in. Okay, sure. So yes. So everything that Beth has said thus far is completely correct. And it gets to the point of what we were just talking about a little bit earlier with respect to how pupil weights are used. So you'll recall that homestead property tax rates vary by district based on that district's per pupil spending. That per pupil spending is comprised of two parts. It's one, it's that district's education spending. And then two, it's that district's long-term weighted ADM. And that long-term weighted ADM is where these pupil weights fit in. So they're used to adjust, as Beth correctly said, to adjust a district's taxing capacity. So they're going to fit into that district's homestead property tax rate and how it's calculated, but they're not saying this district is needs to spend X number of dollars or this district needs to spend some portion of their dollars on this type of, of student and its education. So if they have more taxing capacity, they can make different decisions about how they are using that. They could spend more and potentially have um, keep their tax rate the same or um, they could um, spend less, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say this right, Julia. As our school board member. Sorry, there was a there was vehement hand that went up there, and I didn't mean it to be. But I, I just, I guess I, if I could just add to that yeah. one thing that you're saying, which is that um, the flip side of that is that 
for all of those years when the uh, weights may have been off, other districts had a more advantageous taxing capacity and were doing whatever they wanted with that money. So I, I'm just trying to, I don't want it to seem like, um, you know, the, these schools that are now suddenly getting a bit a greater taxing capacity because they have more students in these categories or kind of somehow like gaming the system or benefiting in ways that is not, aren't equitable. But that's all I wanted to say. That makes sense. And, um, It depends on the decisions that school districts are making on their education spending and how they are taking advantage of that taxing capacity um, and how their, their property tax rates would be affected. So it's a very individualized local decision. Um, so those are the, um, those are the weights. There is a requirement in here that on or before January 2027 and every fifth year thereafter, AOE and JFO um, <clears throat> look at the weights and see if they're still appropriate. Um, and then the General Assembly can update the weights. Um, and then we get into some other portions of the bill. Are you all ready to move on? No, I'm so yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, tax rates. The, the pupil weights are have the potential to affect to affect tax rates. Tax rates may go up and they may go down depending on the number, the the, the way the weights are being applied to their population and their spending decisions. Okay. <clears throat> Section seven creates this tax tax rate review board. So section seven says, section uh, subsection A says, if you're, it looks like under, in fiscal year 2025, when you apply the new funding formula, if the homestead property tax rate is going to go up by 5% or more, uh, it's capped at 5% for fiscal years 2025 to 2023. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so this this was a piece that I was wondering about, and just let me know if it's what you're going to cover shortly, and then I'll just stop talking. But so they're capped at five percent, but they can go over five percent up to ten percent, and if they go beyond ten percent, it triggers this review, right? So the ten percent is um, the education spending. So five percent is the homestead property tax rate. Okay, so they. It's just it cannot go above five percent at all. Um, yes. So the language reads um, that the school district's homestead property tax rate shall be increased by not more than five percent over the prior fiscal year. Okay. In each fiscal year for the five fiscal years from twenty twenty five through twenty twenty nine. So it's kind of a transition no. as the weights are applied. Okay. So there's a five percent property. Um, Homestead property tax rate cap, and you're looking at the, the prior fiscal year. Okay. Then the 10%, are you interested in the 10%? Uh, yes. Okay. So the 10% is in relation to education spending, and that's where the tax rate review comes in. So, um, yes, Senator my question is for Julia, because the, the, the cap is creating a uh, um, confusion um, across the state, I would say. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if when that January 1 note, is that what it's called? January 1 letter? December 17th letter. December 1. So December 1, thank you. When the December 1 letter went out, I'm just wondering, was that 5% cap, was that, in, was that baked into that number that was shared with everyone? Yes. So okay. the 5% tax rate cap was included in the modeling for homestead property tax rate cap was included for the December 1 modeling because it 
is due to take effect through Act 127. Um, and one important note on this um, that is helpful, I think, to keep in mind is that the tax rate cap is at the equalized level. So that's before the application of the CLA. So sometimes the question comes up, well, how is it that tax rates, homestead property tax rates are capped at 5% and we're seeing an average bill increase of 18.5% in that December 1 letter? And that's because a tax bill, as I'm sure the committee is well aware, is comprised of the two parts, right? The, the tax rate and also the value that's being taxed. So if the, ta the tax rate is going up by no more than 5%, however, the, the, the values are estimated to grow significantly more um, by about 14%. So yes, it was included in the December 1 modeling. Thank you. Okay. So in fiscal year 2025, if a school district's per pupil education spending calculated using the funding formula that Act 127 creates, if that increases by 10% or more mm -hmm. over the school district's fiscal year 2024 per pupil spending, is calculated by AOE under the subsection. Um, they've got to use, they've got to have a number to compare, they have to have apples to apples to compare to. So we're looking at applying this new funding formula to 2024 as well. So if you're looking at those two years, if it increases, per people spending increases by more than 10%, then the school district is subject to a tax rate review. And in fiscal years 2026 through 2029, if the school district's per pupil education spending increases by more than 10% over the prior year's spending, then the school district is subject to a tax rate review. And that tax rate review is used to determine if the spending was beyond the school district's control or if it was for other good cause. And Act 127 contains what the tax rate review is supposed to consider these factors. And if the review results in the secretary making a determination that the budget contains excessive increases in per pupil education spending that are within the school district's control and are not supported by good cause, then the homestead property tax rate would be increased by not more than 5% in each fiscal year um, that would otherwise not be capped at 5%, the cap is gone. Can you say that one more time? Yeah. yeah. So, Maybe even slower. Yeah. So if per pupil education spending increases by 10% year over year, so looking at the prior year, using this new funding form of the new weights, right? And there's more to just the, the funding formula than just the weights, but for this conversation, I'm just going to say use the weights. Um, if, if the per pupil spending increases by more than 10%, the school district is subject to a review. And the review is looking at why is where is that 10% increase coming from? Is it things out of the school district's control or there's their other good cause. And if, um, so I'm reading directly from the act, if the secretary determines that the school district's budget contains excessive increases in per pupil education spending that are within the district's control and are not supported by good cause, then if that school district's homestead property tax rate was going to be capped because it was hitting that 5%, that cap is removed. Yes, thank you. So the school district has to force they pass that off onto the property tax for the this this is directly saying that so your yeah. per pupil spending is impacting your property tax rate. So this is saying if the review board determines that there's no good cause, essentially, um, then that cap is removed and your homestead property tax rate is what it is. And if there is good cause, then the cap stays? Yes. 
and then where does the cost, or where does that difference then, how does the rest get paid for? That's my, that's my, that's my question. Um, it all evens out. So the Ed Fund is self-balancing. So the way we arrive at our property taxes to the use of the yields, it, it all kind of balances out. And I am not prepared today to walk you through how we do that, but me or Julia, or Tyler, I mean Julia, because Julia does this day in and day out, um, can come back in and like literally draw the whiteboard. Yeah, I think Julia out may do them. some math with us yeah. next week would be great. So, so, I that, apologize. because That's okay. Like, no worries. Um, in that vein, um, Julia, I was just wondering, do you have a number that you can assign to what that 5% cap is going to cost us, at least for fiscal 25? And then is it all coming out of the end fund? So the to answer your first question, no, we don't have a number for that. And that's really because school district budgets have not been warned or set yet. And we, nor has the yield, right? So we don't know which school districts will see a cap in their rate and also how much remainder needs to be made up. Um, and it is that remainder that will need to be made up, as Beth said, will be made up within the education fund. Um, and it's a policy decision as to if the non-homestead -home property tax rate will take up um, how much how, how it will be made up. So it can be made up either with adjusting the non-homestead property tax rate, adjusting homestead, the homestead property yield, or adjusting other factors in the Ed Fund. Yeah, Thank you. Um, is, are you or are folks concerned that there's no, in, there doesn't seem to be an incentive for districts to kind of stay under the 5% cap. So there's, perhaps a scenario where there are districts really taking advantage of that cap and increasing their spending quite a bit, even though they might not necessarily, um, I hate to say need to, but might otherwise not. So I, I would defer to folks who are building budgets as to where the spending decisions are coming from and if and how the 5% cap will be coming into play. And then with respect to the incentives of that and what you're hoping it does or doesn't do um, is, is really policy. Okay. Senator Williams. Is there a list of the schools that are spending over, going over their 10%? So, is that public information or? Because school district budgets have not been warned or set at this point, um, we don't have that data. I mean, in, for the past five years. So the so the 5% cap is referring to the, um, the ta it's a 5% tax rate cap. So that a tax rate of a school district cannot increase by more than 5% compared to the prior year. Um, so because district tax rates are a function of many factors each year, both at the state level and at the local level. Um, it's not, there's not really an apples to apples comparison that we can um, use to see, you know, which districts may or may not receive the cap this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna run through, I'm mindful of time, I'm gonna run through kind of the rest of it. Um, Several laws were suspended in Act 127. The first is the excess spending penalty, which is an additional liability for school districts um, that spend above an excess excess spending threshold. Um, that's in statute. Um, so that is suspended from fiscal year 2025 through 2029. Again, this is a big change. So how, how do we account for that change? Um, this is this was part of that. So we're going to suspend the whole harmless. And the second piece is suspending the whole harmless provision, which is a provision that means the district's weighted long-term membership is not less than 96.5 percent of their previous year weighted long-term membership. Um, and then there was ballot language is required on school budget ballots. There's a requirement in law 
for there to be uh, reference to the prior year's uh, budget, and that language is suspended for fiscal years 2025 through 2029. Um, the Act 127 also required AOE to come up to create the Universal Income Declaration Forum, which I believe they have done, um, and you got to get all of this demographic information somehow. Um, and then, excuse me, this form also has uses in other areas um, of the education world, especially in um, when it relates to universal meals. Um, so that um, Act 127, if you hear mention of the Universal Income Declaration Form, that's where it came from. Um, another big piece of Act 127 is related to English learners. So you already saw that there is a weight for English learners. Act 127 also provides a small amount of categorical aid for um, districts that have a small amount of English learners. So if a district has one to five English language learners, they will get um, $25,000 flat. And if a district has six to 25 English language learners, um, they will receive $50,000 flat. It also requires school districts to offer certain English language um, services and AOE to provide support and quality assurance. Um, yes, yeah, Mary Hewlett. Thank you. Um, can you explain, because I've heard this anecdotally, that there was a change in the way that we count poverty or maybe define poverty in this uh -huh. bill. Is that, you know, well, let's go back up the clock. Certainly wait, right? Did we change the weight? So looking at all of this old, um, old crossed out language, the poverty, all of the weights changed. The poverty weight changed. Let's see, I'm just looking. Um, oh, Julia must know the answer off the top of your head. Ms. Richter. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the poverty weight, um, yes, it changed. And also the way of collecting the poverty data changed. So since the passage of Act 127, as Beth mentioned, there was the establishment of the Universal Income Declaration form. So that data is used to count poverty before, um, in addition, well, so that's being used to count poverty in addition to the metrics that were being used before, before it was solely the free and reduced price lunch um, data. And, and since the passage of Act 127, there's also the Medicaid data, which is now um, allows for students to be eligible for the free and reduced price lunch, which in turn then is also um, being used for the poverty weighting data. And excuse my ignorance on this one, but are, so are the, I'm looking at the bill, um, I assume universal school meals and um, the universal income declaration determine poverty differently. Is that correct to say, make a determination about poverty in a different way? The, so universal meals, it's not that we don't care about that anymore, but everyone gets a free meal, right? Right. So this, so the, the poverty weight here is specific. Sorry, I thought you were asking about the definition of poverty. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, it's 185% of the federal poverty level. For, which, for which one? Sorry, for the poverty, for the poverty weight. So using the uh, universal income declaration form. Yes. Okay. That is that is the main the intent is that that is the main mechanism to collect that demographic data. Okay, thank you. Um and then so we talked about English language learners or English learners, <laughs> excuse me. Act 127 added five positions to in AOE. Um I outlined them um, very briefly in this little outline for what they were intended to do. Um, this bill also created a requirement for education quality standards. I believe you all took a little bit of testimony on this last year. So there's the education quality standards, which is all about um, many different things, staffing, um, uh, the um, 
uh, courses that are taught, um, et cetera. Um, and this act creates district quality standards for school districts to meet um, in business management, facilities management, and governance practices. And it also required AOE to engage in rulemaking on that. And I believe that's all been done. Um, this act creates a evaluation and reporting requirement. So JFO is required to contract for an evaluation um, of implementation of this act. And that would be due to you all December 15th, 2029. There was also, this is the act that commissioned the cur or set off the career and technical education studies. So remember that was two parts. JFO was supposed to contract for um, a study on uh, governance and funding structures for Vermont's career and technical education system, like all of the available options. That came to you all in March of 2023. And then it was AOE's turn to look at that information and make recommendations for the actual changes for Vermont. Um, I believe you have a bill on your wall um, about the um, career and technical education changes. Um, and I have not seen the AOE report related to this topic, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just have not seen it yet. So I cannot talk to you about it. Um, let's see. Um, this um, act also um, commissioned the Department of Taxes, along with AOE and JFO, to submit a written report on income based educated and income based education tax system. That report was due last year. Um, and it requires several reports from JFO. One of them was in a report on education spending cost containment and ed equitable education funding. That's just a very blanket umbrella topic. Um, and then um, there were lots of conforming changes throughout. I'm going to skip over all of those and just look at the, um, let's see, uh, look at the um, effective dates so you all can see, um, you know, the findings, the goals, the intent, the um, um, suspension of the laws, the formation of the Universal Declaration of Income Form, the staffing, the education quality standards, the reporting requirements, those all took effect um, on July 1, 2022, when the bill was passed. And then the meat of the bill, the funding pieces, the pupil weights and the English learner services pieces, um, um, and then several other, like all of the conforming changes, those don't take effect until July 1, 2024. But again, a lot of that is being used now to determine school district budgets. And that is Act 127. There's a there's a lot there's a lot so more in there. So straightforward. So straightforward. Um, I so I didn't really get my question answered probably because I'm not asking it properly. And I know it's hard to answer a question with qualitative words like I'm using. But when we get back to how we determine poverty for this particular bill. Um, which was which? Which system was more generous? And again, I'm sorry to use that. Word, but was it was pre and reduced lunch a more expansive? Um, Julia, can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was still a threshold of 185 percent of the federal poverty level. Okay. Um, it's how that data is collected that has changed. I believe, and I don't see her camera going on. So. Ms. Richter, we're going to have Morgan uh, have you back in next week to do some, just running some scenarios, if you will, help us with some math problems, kind of just school budget sorts of things would be great. Can you give that some thought and you and I can talk about it? Sure. I'd be happy to talk offline about, you know, if there's anything you'd like me to prepare ahead of time about that. Um, and yes, Beth is right. And um with respect to the the difference between the um, free and reduced price lunch and the um, universal income declaration form, there is a part of the bill, and this is where I defer back to Beth, but there is a part of the bill that was included that, that did say something about um, having AOE compare the two measures to see how, which was picking up a higher poverty count for districts. That is, that is true. Great. Mr. Nichols, 
Uh, you have some final words, for, not totally final. We have some questions, but you were going to weigh in on uh, what you're sort of seeing on the field out there. Yeah, and I can do that real, real briefly in, re in a real general way. Uh, Jay Nichols, for the record, Executive Director of Vermont Principals Association. In terms of the new pupil waiting <clears throat> and the impact on FY25 budgets, the cost drivers I mentioned previously to Senate Education are exasperating the circumstances. I guess if there was a difficult year to make these changes, it would probably be this year, given those cost drivers, such as increased contracts due to the hiring issues we and the rest of the nation have faced in education, the 16.5% increase in insurance costs, uh, the loss of the ESSER funds, the changing values of Vermont home assessments after the pandemic and the impact, therefore, on common level of appraisal, you know, the increased contractor costs, such as speech language services, et cetera. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've spoken to a number of principal groups, including recently the Chittenden County Regional Principals. The consensus uh, there seems to be that for those who are self-described losing in relationship to the people waiting changes uh, from the current system to the new system that we're moving to, they're feeling the burden much more so and are in positions in which simply maintain current programming will require significant budget cuts, despite the fact that the needs have not dis diminished in those schools in terms of the needs of the kids. For those who are expecting a lot more financial resources uh, to do the things that in the past they haven't been able to do because of lack of funding, the aforementioned cost drivers are soaking up all of the additional taxing authority for some of them so that they will only be able to keep and maybe even increase programs slightly, but not to the level that they had anticipated with the passage of Act 127. Uh, and I want to make it clear, uh, again, this is just off the top of my head, I had, had much time to prepare for this, that I don't think the issues that are arising are necessarily the fault of anybody. I also want to make it clear from my perspective and my association's perspective that we appreciate the work of the Waiting Study Committee and the People Waiting Task Force. I'm not even sure if those are the, really the right names of those two groups, but, and the research approach they took to make the suggested waiting changes that the General Assembly ultimately ended up adopting. Like any new change to statewide funding formula, uh, we're going to need to wait a while to see what the impact is and what that means in terms of costs across the board on the system and the level of services provided. The bigger immediate concerns are the cost drivers that schools are dealing with, for which they have little, if any, recourse to address, and that are sometimes getting conflated with the changes related to the uh, pupil waiting changes. From my perspective, uh, to get into these questions, I think uh, you should invite in for the committee to hear Morgan Daybell, who's the business manager of Franklin Northeast. He's currently the president of Vermont School, Board, uh, Vermont School Business Officials Association. Full disclosure, I hired him as a business manager many years ago. Uh, Jeff Francis, the executive director of the Vermont Superintendents Association, who understands this law as well as anybody. Uh, Brad James, the school finance manager of the Agency of Education. And then Sue Sazowski, the executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association. They all are much more in the weeds on this than I am, and I think they all could bring you beneficial testimony. Great. And also, I should say, you can't do better than Beth St. James and Julia Richter for, for questions. Well, of course he's going to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Senator Kulik. I just wanted to push back on the designation of losers. I know you didn't necessarily mean that, Mr. Nichols. Yeah, but I put it in quotations because that's right, actually... Right. Yeah, for 25 years, to. ostensibly, some of those districts have been benefiting from an outdated model that, you know, so I just, I don't think we should talk about winners and losers, but that's just Good me. No, no argument on my part, Senator. That's just how, and that's why I said, quote, unquote, losers, because that's how some of them are referring to it. Sure. You're absolutely right. And we think that this system, we testified in favor of this new system, and we think that the direction that we're headed uh, makes more sense. It's more research-based. It's not numbers that were kind of pulled out of the air like what we've been living under previously. I just think the the exasperation of it is the fact of all those other cost drivers that I mentioned before. So I do have one yeah, last please. Question. Sorry, one last question for Julia, and I apologize for all the questions. But um, when you came up with the December one letter, um, and you must have done some modeling for that five percent cap. What can you can you tell us what number you use for that model? Um, I'm happy to talk about the modeling. When you say what number I used, which number are you referring to? Well, how far above five percent did you go? Did you go six, seven? So, 
so so when refer when referring to the property tax cap, it's all um, property tax rates for homestead property tax rates cannot increase by more than five percent. So the modeling held to make sure that all equalized homestead property tax rates would follow the legislation and not increase by more than five percent. But if districts do increase their spending above that threshold. Maybe I'm just getting confused and confusing myself at this late date. Yeah, I I think that it's possible that that sort of two things are being conflated. Yeah. One is the five percent property tax rate cap, yeah. and then two is the ten percent upon which a district must go in front the the ten percent. Um, change in ed spending per pupil, which triggers a district needing to go before the tax rate review board. So in the modeling, we assumed all school districts would, um, regardless of how much their ed spending per pupil compared to the prior year increased, all school districts would be eligible for the 5% homestead property tax rate cap. Right. But hypothetically, if a school district raises their spending to the point where normally they would be up at an 8% increase, let's say tax rate increase, but we're capping them at five, that's a 3% differential. So is that, did you use that 3% when you modeled out your numbers for the December 1 meeting or letter? Yeah. So that, so that, those funds that are not going to be raised by those districts, so in that example, the 3%, we say, okay, that 3% additional tax rate above the 5% is not going to be raised on this tax base. So it needs to flow back into the model and, and fit into the other property tax rates to make sure that there's sufficient revenues in the education fund. And in the December 1 modeling, we are required to model a uniform change. So that uniformly went on to non-homestead property tax rates and homestead property tax rates that were not capped at 5%. Does that answer your question? So I'll sleep on that one. I, I think honestly, our next step, one of our next steps, will be to have the chair of finance in. Since no matter what we're thinking and wanting to do, all this work does the decisions ultimately lie down the hall. So I think what we should ask in our comings is tell us what you need from us. What are some of the things you're thinking about, and have a conversation with her next week as well. Okay, uh, we're going to leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Thank this you. has been incredibly helpful. Thank you.